Now, here's, here's what I want to do to start with, and these are just some things that I have used over the years as far as just a study method. Now, you can develop your own, uh, but you need some kind of system, in, in my thoughts, so that when you open up a book like this, that you can see that there is a system where that you have worked with um, that they, it's not just a bunch of highlighting because you know if you get wild with a highlighter it, it can really get very confusing all right so what i've done is over the years i have developed and if you were to take my word of flame adult uh, sunday school hardbound books you would see this system and it's just kind of something that i have developed over uh, the over the years uh, the first thing that I do is I have a red pen and what I do with that red pen if there is something that I disagree with uh, generally what I will do is I will underline or even draw a strike through that sentence with a red pen and then I'll write an explanation out in the margin why that I disagree with that particular point um, anytime that you open up those books and you see a scriptural reference, that scriptural reference is, uh, I use that with a blue uh, highlighter. So, for instance, uh, if you look on page 27 in chapter 1, uh, you can see all these, I don't know if you can see it from out there, but all the blue that is a scriptural reference. So scattered down through that paragraph on page 27, that all the scriptural references are, that I just underline any scriptural reference is in a blue, with a blue highlighter, so that whenever I open that book up and I look at it, I know that that is a, a scriptural reference. Uh, then just general emphasis, if I'm just reading, and uh, something jumps out at me, I'll just underline, I'll just use a, a yellow highlighter uh, for that. And uh, that's just, you know, and then when you open it up, there's things that you do. Uh, again, I encourage you to write in the margins. Uh, you may, you, you have to do it neatly and carefully, uh, but I do write in the margins of my books so that it will kind of help me. Um, another thing that I do is I a purple uh, pen or purple highlighter. Uh, anytime that there are like key terms uh, that are in that particular uh, part, turn to page 22. Uh, if you got the older book, I'm not sure what what page that is, but that's going to be under uh, this is where we're it's the introduction to systematic theology. It's very early in that chapter under a definition of systematic theology. You see right there where it says down toward the, the next to the last paragraph, it says systematic theology as we have defined it differs from Old Testament theology, New Testament theology, and biblical theology. I, under, I highlighted all three of those different terms in a purple because what that prompts me to do is that's important for, for you to def have a definition for that uh, particular for that particular word. Um, here's something that has worked well for me over the years. Uh, I take an orange uh, highlighter, uh, turn to page 28. And this is under the part where it talks about systematic theology as the benefit for our lives. See right there, under, right up under number two, it says, First, studying theology helps us overcome wrong ideas. Skip down to the next to the last paragraph. It says, studying systemat Second, studying systematic theology helps us to be able, and so forth. Uh, I underline that in orange. Look over on page 29 where it says third studying systematic theology will help us grow as Christians. I used an orange highlighter in that. Are you, you see y'all see that? Okay. And it kind of it kind of looks like that. So um, so whenever I get to a page and I look, I can realize kind of like a bullet system. Uh, if, you, if you're familiar with a bullet system, I don't know if you've ever heard of bullet journaling. What that does is that makes points 
and you realize that these are the points that you're working with, I use an orange highlighter to do that. Anytime that there is something that is a quote uh, I, that's not biblical, I generally will, uh, will make quotes in green. And so scattered throughout here, there are various others uh, things. Then if there's something that, that is written uh, that, that maybe I want to come back to at a later time, I underline that in pink. And so pink is just something that you come back to at a later time. And most of the time, I never get a later time. And so anyways, the orange is the bullet list. If you've got like one, two, three, four, you just under underline, you know, what the, the numeric part is uh, in that. Okay? And um, so red is what I disagree with. Blue is a scriptural reference. Just a regular yellow highlighter is just general reading that I've done. Um, purple are key terms or a vocabulary list. Um numbered or bullet numbered or bulleted points is orange and then green are non-biblical quotes like if they have Joe Blow says you know tomorrow it's going to be sunny and I highlight that quote all right and then the part where I used in pink that is something to come back to later on there's also another couple of things that I do as well if I run across something that prompts a sermon thought or a Bible study that I want to go back to again at a later point, what I do is I dog ear that page. Y'all know what that is? Yeah. Okay. You, you fold the page down at the top, and then when you pick that book up again, you realize that there are things that you have folded down, and you can go back to that book and pick that book up. And if you're a preacher, you can develop you know, sermons, Bible studies, Sunday school teachers, whatever you want to do, that's just something uh, to to kind of help. Because I, I will tell you this, it seems like that Sunday for me is about every other day. I know Brother Patterson probably feels the same way. It's like you turn around and here it is, it's Sunday again. It's time to preach. It's time to... And so you're constantly having to stay, you know, prepared and working to, to preach. Now, I want to um, go into a few things uh, before we start. I've written some notes. I'm going to try not to deviate into too many rabbit trails. I'm going to try to primarily stay with the text. But there are some things that I want to kind of, just in the introduction, uh, just kind of pass along to you. Uh, this was said by a man by the name of Sinclair Ferguson. And uh, he said, the goal of theology is the worship of God. He said, the posture of theology is on your knees. And the model of theology is repentance. And I think that's a pretty good summary. That whenever you start looking at uh, you know, what's going on, the, the goal of theology is not for you to get smart, but it is for you to worship God. And I'll get into that a little bit more as we go on. And uh, so, when you start looking at that, now I want you to turn uh, to, if you've got the, the big book, I want you to turn to page 13. And you'll see uh, right in the front, if you've got the 2000 part, it'll say abbreviations. It's right after the table of contents. I want to point out some things here to you. And I've highlighted some books that over the years have been helpful for me. Um, you look up at the very, up at the top, there's one called the BDB. The reason that I mention that is because if you have eSword, which is a free Bible program, if you have eSword.net, go, go to eSword.net and download that. The BDB is the brown driver Briggs Hebrew dictionary and that is a very good resource for you to be able to, to have uh, available to you uh, now skip down and look and you see the EBC this is the expositors Bible commentary 
uh, its published or its editor is Frank Goblin. Now he didn't write all of the uh, volumes to that. He was the general editor for the set. That is a set of books. That is a very good set of books if you're interested in most of you probably are not interested in buying them, but I did. I, I do want to kind of let you know that that's a good one to have. Skip down and you see the ISBE or the ISBE. That's the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. That is kind of the mainstay of a Bible diction or a Bible encyclopedia. Uh, Brother Griffin kind of introduced us to that whenever I was in Bible college, and it basically is that. It's a it's a it's an encyclopedia. Now, what's happened now that everything's online, you can actually get online and you can have access to a lot of the of the ISBE, uh, and it can it, you can use it kind of like as as an encyclopedia. Uh, you look down there, you see the KJV. That's just the King James version or the authorized version. And uh, that's just kind of most of you uh, have a King James. Turn over to the next page and you see the NASB. That's the New American Standard Bible. Uh, that is again, it's another resource. It's a translation. Uh, the difference between the New American Standard and the ESV, ESV is the uh, English Standard Version. The English Standard Version is written sort of a thought for thought. What that means is, is when you look at it, that they read that and they're thinking, okay, what thought is this person speaking about? And then they will kind of translate that as a thought for thought process. And it may not be exactly like uh, you would read in, if you take King James and translate it, it would not be exactly in that same way. The difference between the New American Standard is the New American Standard is sort of a word for word. And so they use a term, they say, so when you're reading it, it makes it a little more wooden or a little more clunky. Uh, but again, the New American Standard and the English Standard Version are probably more modernized versions that people sometimes have problems with, you know, reading the King James, that that is a newer translation to use. I would also uh, tell, I'm not a big fan of the New International Version, um, but, but again, it can be a, a helpful resource. Uh, the New King James Version is going to be very closely related to the King James they take the these and thous and kind of modify and modernize them. Some of the words are changed, but not very many of them. The, King, the New King James and the KJV kind of pretty well goes uh, somewhat together. Uh, then if you look down to the uh, TDNT, uh, that's the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. Uh, that's written by a couple of German guys, Kittle. And Frederick, um, whenever I was in Bible college, that was the uh, set of books that was referred to as Kittle and Bits. <laughs> and so, anyways, it's just a dictionary that, that kind of, it's pretty complicated to kind of use it. And it's, uh, I just thought I would mention it to you if you were um, you know, interested in, in, in doing that. The TNTC and the TOTC. Those are the Tyndale New Testament and Old Testament commentaries. Uh, those are pretty conservative in their, in their uh, views. And then the Word Biblical Commentary, that's another one. Now the reason I'm telling you about those is if you go into a thrift store and you happen to see these individual volumes, j just go ahead and, and grab them, even if you don't use them. Uh, you're, even if you don't think you're going to use them right then, go ahead and grab them because at some point you may have uh, the opportunity to work with uh, that. So, uh, anyways, and then there are two more that I want to enter, tell you about, and these are they're high dollar commentaries, but they are extremely good. They come from a very conservative uh, trend. 
Uh, in fact, there are several authors in the New Testament that are uh, kind of a Pentecostal flavor to them. Um, so that that's one of the reasons that I do I do like to read that, and I don't have the full set because it's very pricey. The uh, New Testament is like six hundred and almost seven hundred dollars, and the uh, Old Testament is a little over a thousand dollars. So it's quite an investment, um, you know. Again, and uh, I know some of you kind of looking at me a little funny, but again, the guys that you know that work with their you know, tools and power saws and all that sort of, they don't, they don't think anything about a truck snap-on or some of these companies pulling up and them spending four and $500 on a toolbox or tools or various things. So I look at that, that, you know, books are the tools that I use. And so again, but, but it's, I don't have that. It's on a wish list and I don't know if I'll ever get it. But anyway, I thought I would uh, mention that to you. Now, I want to go through the preface. You kind of think that's a strange thing, but I do want to kind of hit some high, high spots here as we go through the preface. First of all, I want to stress to you about this class. This class is not to make things deep. Because if you walk out of here with, you know, you can't, like, what was he saying? What was that? That is not the goal of this class. And I think a lot of times that whenever you start thinking about uh, seminaries, Bible colleges, that one of the things that the instructors and the professors, and they may not do this purposely, uh, but they, they can get into places where that it's not clear to those students that are, that are hearing that particular class. That is not the purpose of this class. This class is not to be deep. Also, this class is not to make you smart. That's not the goal that we study the Bible for so that we can get smart. The goal of studying the Word of God is 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. You're studying to show yourself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. So the goal is, is for us to look at Scripture and see what it has to say and then for all of a sudden the light bulbs to start going off in your mind to help you to be able to understand. In fact, I, I want you to turn to 2 Timothy 2.15 and I want to just kind of walk through some uh, parts here just kind of quickly. Uh, but 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, again, you, you, you've heard, I'm sure you know this, uh, that, that Paul is writing to a young man. I say young, he's somewhere between 35 and 40 years old. He's pastoring uh, a church in Ephesus. And uh, so he, he's writing to him and he's telling him some things, all right? Verse 15 uh, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Verse 16 tells us how that you are supposed to go about being a diligent workman. You shun profane and vain babblings. Why? Because they're going to increase unto more ungodliness. And the result is, is that their word will eat us as doth a canker of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. We don't really know exactly who those men were, but they most likely were ministers. And Paul said that their teaching or their learning that they had tried to come to had caused them they had developed a canker. Now you say, well, what kind of word is that? Uh, to interchange that is gangrene. And uh, we got a few, some medical folks here. If you've ever seen a gangrenous limb, it, it's awful. Okay, there's no blood flow to it. It, it, is, it, is, it has gangrene. A lot of times there's germs and things that will grow there. It generally will end up having to be amputated. And so what Paul is saying is he's telling Timothy, now you need to be a workman. Now get this in your mind, okay? That when you're studying the Bible, you are doing hard work. 
Now, here's a challenge for Bible study in our generation. Most of the time when we pick, I, I want to be totally categorize everybody like this, but there's a lot of people that I know whenever they are looking to study their Bible, they're wanting to get a buzz. Okay, they they want to they want to read the Bible, and they want to get goosebumps and get all of this. Okay, that is not the goal for you to study the Bible. And sometimes studying Scripture is hard work. Now, I know you hadn't paid to take this class. I know you're not going to get a grade. I know we're not going to be doing tests. But I, I would ask you this question. If you go out to Wallace or you go out to Troy, you're going to pay anywhere from $400 to $600 to take one class. When you take that class, a lot of times, especially when you get older and you're paying for it yourself, you eat, sleep, and breathe that class while you are taking that class. You're taking notes, you're writing on note cards, you're watching lectures, you're doing everything you can to put some energy in that because you want to pass that class. Now, I wish I could do you like that with this right here. Because here's the thing we have to understand. This book has the principles that's going to help us to have eternal life. All right? So when you start looking at this class, this systematic theology class, the goal is not to make things deep or for you to get smart. What is the goal? The answer to that is in Matthew 28. And Jesus left this, these words with his disciples whenever uh, this was the, one of the last things that he said to them prior uh, to his ascension. Matthew 28 and uh, 19. This is a familiar verse uh, to, to all of you. Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Notice these two words that jumps out in verse 19 and also in verse 20. You see the words there, teach in 19, 20, teaching. So when you start looking at Scripture, what's the goal? Not for you to get a buzz and get goosebumps, and that may happen. I mean, there's been times where I literally have felt the power and the presence of God while I have been studying Scripture. There's been other times where it has been as dry as hay. That does not mean that the Lord was not there with me while I was studying the Word of God. But what's the purpose? The purpose is, is to advance the gospel so that we will be able to teach people what's in the Word of God. So, so that's one of the goals of this class that I am trying, that I'm going to try to, to work with is that when you walk out of here, you have a understanding uh, of some doctrines and some things in Scripture so that you will be able to explain them to somebody in a way that's going to be helpful to them in their uh, walk with the Lord. Now, uh, this book here, and the author brings it out, this book again, even though it is, I don't know, 1,500, no, 1,300 pages, this book is 1,300 pages long. This book is an introduction to systematic theology. I've got two sets of books upstairs. Uh, one of them is a four-volume set that's probably close to uh, 6,000 pages. It is a systematic theology. So what this book is is just an introduction. When you start looking at the doctrine of the church, we'll get to that. The doctrine of man, uh, we'll get to uh, the uh, eschatology or the last things. 
there are volumes of books that have been written on those single subjects. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of take a bird's eye view and look down on this and it'll kind of give you an idea as to where that is coming from. All right. So whenever you you and he brings this out and I appreciate the way he's written it. He said, I'm convinced that most Christians are able to understand the doctrinal teachings of the Bible in considerable depth, provided that they are presented clearly and without the use of highly technical language. I, and I believe that. I agree. I think that you can understand the Bible and my job to teach is to not make it where it, you can't understand what the Bible has to say. All right? Now, there are some distinctive features about this book that is written and number one there is a clear biblical basis for doctrines. Um, because theology is explicitly based on the teachings of Scripture, what takes place is, is that in each chapter, what he does is he gives other areas of support in the Bible for that particular doctrine. Now that's one of the things that systematic theology does. It will take a doctrine and then it will move to kind of trace it all the way through the Bible and just kind of hit the high spots to help you to be able to see how that doctrine came into being and what that purpose is. There's a doctrine and one of the chapters here, we'll get into this, uh, there's a doctrine of uh, angels, demons, Satan, and that's, that's an area you have to, to get. And again, I want you to grasp Satan is not God's equal. Satan is a fallen angel. His equal is going to be Gabriel and Michael. There very well could be some other archangels that are not named, but we do know that those archangels are named by Scripture. And so Satan is not on the same equivalent with the Lord. And, and I think a lot of times we get that idea in our mind that the devil is just as powerful as God. This book opens that doctrine up and helps us to see the doctrine of angels and fallen angels, which are demons, and we'll, we'll go through that. All right? Acts 17 and 11, we read this, uh, I think I mentioned it last night, but Acts 17 and uh, I actually want to start in verse 10. Uh, this is a very noble goal for, for all of us to have. Acts chapter 17 and look in verse 10. The Bible says there, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Now that's a pretty powerful scripture that Luke writes in that he describes these people that are called the Bereans. What made the Bereans powerful? They, they received the word with all readiness of mind and they searched the scriptures daily to see if those things were so. Now let me interject something. And I do believe that, uh, that God has set up authority in the church. At the same time, I also believe that the Roman Catholic system has kind of set up and we kind of, we kind of fall in, fell into that, that what they tried to do was to create a hierarchy so that just only the priest, and for years, even in the Dark Ages, but regular folks like us would not have had access to the Bible. I mean, it was chained to the church, to the pulpit in the church, and you could not, of course, most of those people were illiterate anyway and couldn't read, but the, the scriptures were held and the interpretation came from a priest who really didn't know beans about the Bible either. But, but, but again, what it did was created a caste system. And so people kind of thought, well, you know, such and so is a preacher. And, and I don't know as much about Scripture as a preacher. Have you ever said that before? Mm -hmm. Or you use this statement, well, you know, I'm not a theologian. Mm -hmm. 
and then you say whatever you're going to say about the Bible. I'm going to tell you this. All of us are theologians. Every person in this room, you are a theologian. Now, you may not think you are, but you are a theologian because you look at Scripture and you come away with thoughts and concepts and ideas about what you think God is and everybody's got an opinion about what they think the Bible says. It's important for us to know what the Bible says. And so when you look at Scripture, there is a clear biblical basis for the doctrines that are there. So the goal is for us to have an understanding. Uh, the second thing that he talks about is that uh, he, he I, and I agree with this, I, when, when Brother Griffin uh, at TBC taught us, that's one of the things that you would walk out of those classes and there were things in Scripture that you listen to him teach. And of course, he's been here a few times and y'all heard him teach. There's a clarity about whenever he starts teaching something, you're like, I see what he's talking about. That's the goal for this class is that I want you to be able to look at Scripture and say, I see what you're talking about. Not me, but what the Bible's talking about. All right? So a student that comes out of a class like this and they're filled with doctrinal uncertainty and a thousand unanswered questions, that troubles me. Turn over to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, and I want you to look to verse 9. Here, here's, what, here's what Paul says. He says, Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Now let me read that to you in, I don't know, maybe the NIV. Uh, whichever one that, that this book uses. Um, I can't remember. Um, uh, he uses the RSV. That's, that's interesting. Um, Titus 1.9, he says, able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to confute those who contradict it. Now here's what he's getting at. He's saying that if you walk away from this class and what I have done is I pulled and picked at things and said, well, you know, we're not sure that the, Bible can, that the Bible says this. We're not sure that the Bible really says this. We're not sure that Moses wrote the Pentateuch. We're not sure that, that Jonah really was in the whale. We're not sure that Jesus really accomplished these miracles. As That is the danger of higher learning and a lot of that kind of stuff goes on in seminaries. Right. Now here's the scary part. The scary part is when you look back to where did that influence come from? Some of it, not all of it, but came from very liberal German theologians. And it influenced American in fact, it probably influenced them worldwide because the Germans now, that's one of the things that, that people, well, we've got these German commentaries and we can read, you know, these commentaries in German. In fact, Kyle and Dillich, which is an Old Testament, uh, Old Testament commentary, I've got a copy of it. It's very conservative in its approach, but Kyle and Dillich, both of those men were Germans. And what people would do is they would study German to be able to read what these men had wrote on these commentaries. But as time progressed on, there became a part of liberalism, and I'll get to that here uh, in just a moment, that uh, liberalism kind of caused people to get away from the idea of inerrancy. Which means that when I say the scriptures are, are inerrant, that means that there are no errors and there are no contradictions that you see in scripture. Now there's times where people say, well, there, there's some contradictions here, but what you have to do is you have to learn how to cross-reference. And you have to let scripture interpret scripture. We'll get to that here in just a few minutes as well. 
And that is the important part. I don't need to look. The commentaries are helpful and I use them. But commentaries are not the last word on Scripture. The best thing you can do is to use Scripture to interpret Scripture. That's what makes the treasury of scriptural knowledge one of the most beneficial and helpful books that you can have. Or if you use a, a e-sword, it's a free download that you can use. It's extremely good because it's a very powerful cross-reference tool. Y'all, you, you know what I mean when I say cross-reference? It means that you've got one scripture and it'll, it'll tack it on to another scripture and you go find that one and then you bounce to the next one and the next one and what it'll do is create a loop, gen generally speaking, to help you get an idea about what's going on. All right. So when you start looking at this, the goal is for you not to walk out of here and say, well, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. I'm trying to get to the place where in Titus 1 and 9 that you may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort or to encourage and convince the gainsayers that you have confidence that this is what the Bible has to say. It's not for you to walk out of here and have a question about what's going on. All right. I want you to look into that um, second paragraph there. You see where it says it's called the Chicago Statement of the International Council of Biblical Inerrancy. I'm going to encourage you to download that. You can, you can Google that. You can just look on, if you, an uh, easy way to Google it is, Chicago, is the Chicago Statement of Inerrancy. That took place in the late 70s because there were people that were beginning to be critical about the Bible. It is a very good document for you to download and to read because what they do is they affirm the inerrancy and the authority of Scripture. Now, it's interesting that working on 40, 30, 40 years, 40 years has passed. Now, again, you're starting to see people come up and begin to question whether Scripture is inspired, whether it's inerrant. How, how do you explain that? Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14. Paul said that there are shifting winds of doctrine. He encourages us not to be tossed to and fro like children. He wants spiritual maturity to take place in our lives. But here's the part that I, I want you to notice, and you'll live long enough to see this, that there are times where that doctrinal challenges will come and they'll stay for a little bit and then people will come out and they'll teach with clarity and understanding so that the church is able to understand what's taking place and they'll kind of fizzle out and move on. And then 30 years later, it'll crop back up again. What's taking place? The devil is using those shifting winds of doctrine to try to deceive people so that they will be lost. And it's a pretty scary cycle that you see going uh, through that particular deal. Now, the third thing uh, is that we need to think about as far as this uh, matter of the, of, of the features that this book is in. Uh, number three talks about the application for life. And that's, that's important. Now what does application in life mean? Application in life means just like if you still have your Bible open to, first, or to Titus 1 and 9, What's the application there of learning the faithful word or learning doctrine? So that you're going to be able to teach sound doctrine and to convince people. You see that application there? That's the part that we look at that Scripture is not just a bunch of dry dust for theologians to worry about and scramble around and try to figure out what's taking place and what's going on. The whole focus of Scripture is, is that we can put shoes on it and we can walk it around in our lives. The passages, and I'm, I'm sure I've mentioned these to you before, the passages in uh, Ephesians 4 and then the mirror passages in Colossians 3, I believe, where Paul talks about put off certain things and then he says put on certain things. That's application. 
Now, what's that application for? That application is for us to understand the doctrine of salvation, that if the Holy Ghost, if you have been born again, what's going to take place? There are going to be things that are going to grow in your life, and you're going to be able to, uh, to go out and to live a Christian life, and you're, there's going to be the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5. You're going to see the fruit of the Spirit that's going to be growing in that person's life. Life. That's where that you say, okay, well, if somebody's been converted, if they've been born again, how do I know that they have been born again? Well, we believe the initial sign is that they will speak with tongues. But as you progress on in your spiritual walk, you're, you, the goal of salvation is not just so you can speak in tongues. The goal of salvation is, is Christian maturity so that we can advance the gospel. That's, that's the purpose of it. And I'm getting, I am sound like I'm preaching up here. Um, <clears throat> so, true theology is teaching that which accords with godliness. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 3. Now, he opens up something, and I want to explain a term to use here to you in number 4. He says that the focus is on the evangelical uh, world. What, what does that word, you may have heard that word before, evangelical. What does that mean? That's the big tent of Christianity. And it's a lot of different, you know, flavors and brands and et cetera and so forth. That's what th that word means. And that word means that everybody's under the big tent. I get nervous about being under the big tent. Because I believe that ultimately everybody that's under the big tent are either going to have to make one of two decisions. You're either going to have to go to Rome, which is going to be a mother, or you're going to have to go to Jerusalem, which is also going to be a mother. And if you've got first century doctrine, then what we believe that uh, took place in the book of Acts, where are we going to go? We're going back to Jerusalem. It's going to start in the upper room. Yes. Not, not, not in the Vatican. And we'll, we'll explain some of that too as we go on. And you probably will realize that at some point that I believe... <laughs> That, that I think there's some conspiracy theories. The, the, the part of me that appeals to the conspiracy theory, go it. I believe it went into overdrive in the 4th century. And we'll talk about the creeds and confessions and councils and et cetera and so forth. That's where I believe that the conspiracy theories all started working and going. And, and you're looking at me now kind of like I'm, I fell off and bumped my head. But I do believe. I believe that where it veered off and got away from the original apostles' doctrine was what took place in the 4th century. And I cannot, as a solid apostolic, marry up and link up with that. That's why we need to know about church history. And periodically people will ask, well, what about the Reformers? That's a good question. What about the Reformers? Here's what I know about the Reformers. I know that Martin Luther killed the Anabaptists. The Anabaptists were very similar to us in that they baptized by immersion, baptized in Jesus' name. Martin Luther killed them. John Calvin was a reformer. What did John Calvin do? John Calvin killed, and they try to paint it up and say, no, he didn't. But John Calvin was at the root of the one that killed Michael Servetus. Michael Servetus, what got him in hot water with, uh, with John Calvin is that he wrote a response to uh, Calvin's Institutes of Christian Religion, which is a big volume that Calvin wrote. And what happened was, was Servetus was a oneness, basically a oneness theologian and wrote a book called Against the Trinity. And that's what caused him to be to be. Uh, martyr. So when people start asking, well, what about the reformers? What, what are you going to do? I'll tell you what I'm going to do with them. I'm going to get away from them because they do not affirm the doctrines that came out of the upper room and the early church. Okay, let's move on a little further. And they say, well, what about John and Charles Wesley? Well, what about John and Charles Wesley? John and Charles Wesley believed in the Holy Ghost. 
In fact, people in the holiness movement and some of the, even beyond them, some of the circuit riders, Peter Cartwright was one of those guys, that what they, how they looked at the Holy Ghost was they believed it was a second work or some even called it a third work of grace. They, they, did, they believed, or you find some term called entire sanctification. That was where they say, well, you become a Christian and then later on you get to become, uh, you get in a place where there is entire sanctification. That does not hold true with what Jesus told Nicodemus, except the man be born of the water and the spirit. There is no entrance in to the kingdom of God. So we have to understand that we cannot allow our theology to be translated by what took place in the 4th century. So we just kind of keep that in mind. Now, liberalism is at the root of a church that has a form of godliness but denies the power thereof. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5. And when you look at what, what Paul said beginning in 2 Timothy chapter 3, what was his instructions to, to Timothy? He said, Timothy, he said, I want you to know that in the last days perilous times are going to come. Men will be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high minded lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God he said these guys are going to be in the church he said but here's what I want you to know they're going to have a form of godliness but they're going to deny the power thereof from such turn away now a lot of times what we want to do is we want to lock up the power business with the Holy Ghost we want to lock up the power business with the miracle signs and wonders. But uniquely connected to that power is an understanding of the apostolic doctrine of who Jesus is and what he did for us and why he died for us so that we could have eternal salvation. All right, so that's what liberalism does. Liberalism gets into a place, and there's a, a story that's mentioned here. You probably heard that before. Hans Christian Anderson, he tells that story about the king that or the emperor. You know, he dressed up, and they thought he was fantastic, had this big parade, and all these people are looking at him and talking about all oh, the emperor's clothes are fantastic. And then some little old kid looks up at him and says, the emperor doesn't have any clothes on. All right, that, that's where you have to realize that there need to be people to stand up in this generation and to say the emperor is not clothed. Now, I'm talking about doctrinal matters in that way. So where do we go? We've got to have an adherence, a connection to what the Bible uh, has to say. And uh, then I also believe this. I believe that this class, as we go on, uh, that there will be things that you will discover in doctrine that you think, you know what, I've, I've always believed that, but I couldn't quite articulate it and explain it. But now I can explain why I believe what I believe. It's important for us to be able to give an answer whenever we're asked a question. All right. And uh, then here's the last part, and I have been I have been in this parade waving this flag for quite a little while. Uh, a sense for an urgent need of greater doctrinal understanding in the whole church. I'm concerned. I want to reiterate. I want to stand up on this right here and say I'm concerned about biblical illiteracy in our generation. The devil can take advantage of our minds if we do not know what is in the Word of God. And so one of the ways that we're going to do that is through this class is we will be able to go through some things so that I, I'm praying that you're going to be able to get some knowledge in, in your mind. Now here's one of the things, and we'll stop here in, in 
two minutes after I get through making this point. One of the good things about this setting that we're in right now, which makes it different from whenever we're in the sanctuary, is you can't raise your hand up and say, hey, wait a minute, uh, let me talk about that a little more. But we can do that in here. We can stop and we can say, okay, what's the question? And then we can walk through and what does that do? That just helps us in the process uh, of learning because a clear understanding of the Scripture helps to set a lot of issues straight in our minds. And there's a lot of things that are coming at the church in this generation now. One of the deals right now is this matter of identity. Okay? Pe people don't have identity problems. Trying to figure out whether they're transgender, et cetera, so forth and so on, all right? There are not identity problems. They're sin problems. The Lord created male and female, created he them. And yet what's happened is, is the, the, the enemy has so hammered this world that their minds, literally, they're punch drunk. And they're unable to see the clarity of what Scripture has to say. And so I will say as well, though, that there's times where whenever you start standing for Scripture, be prepared to be attacked. Yeah. Because people are not interested in hearing what the Lord really has to say. They want about $3 worth of God, just enough to get them to the next gas station and the next place so they can go on about their lives. Okay? All right, let's take about a, a five-minute, ten-minute break or so. We'll come back uh, here in just a few minutes, and we'll get started back, and we'll go start chapter in chapter one.